Okay, so welcome to our online container gardening class. Uh, we have a lot of fun things planned for our in-person container gardening class, which um, we're bummed we're not doing, but we're excited to have Marjorie here um, to teach us about how to do annuals and perennials in our um, pots. So if you guys have questions, feel free to ask them in the Q&A section of the little webinar, and I will be answering questions as, as we go along. Um, Marjorie is with Bullard Bay Gardens, and I'll let you talk a little bit about your company, but they have the best selection of perennials and a crazy good amount of animals as well. So if you're ever up in the area, swing by and, and check her out and Bullard Bay Gardens out. <laughs> Can you hear? All right. Right. So yeah, I am involved with Willard Bay Gardens, um, the owner. We're just right off of Highway 89, um, just across from the bay, right under the mountain. It's a beautiful place, and uh, we do specialize in perennials, especially ones that can handle the native um, desert kind of conditions that we live in. So if you're looking for those, we can have some fun, like. Um, warm and tea and lots of salvia, penstemons, those kind of things. But we do annuals too, and we do containers, we do baskets, um, we do a lot of things, So, but not grass, just saying. We like the flowers. So today we're just going to talk about um, how to build a container. And you can't just, it's, it sounds simple, but it's, there's a little more to it. So I'm going to give you a few things to think about as we're talking about how you're going to build this container. So one of the first things to think about is where is this container going to go? Where are you going to put it? Is it going to be on your porch? Is it going to be um, out in the hot sun, by the bed, by the pool? What is your light? What is your sun going to look like? And so remember that. You're going to, you're going to choose the plants according to what you're going to, um, what your light's going to be. Your shade plants are not going to be happy to have without the hot sun and vice versa. Your hot plants, you're going to water them too much, they're not going to dry out, they're not going to be happy in the shade. So the other thing to think about too is where is this going to container going to sit? Is it going to be hanging up above? What are you going to see when it's hanging? Or is it going to sit by your front step? Um, is it going to sit up against the building? Is it going to be out? All those things you have to think about when, before you decide what's going to go in this container. Um, I we kind of put these up high so that you can kind of see um, a little bit better. And I'm kind of reaching over, but um, and then you're going to look at how big your container is too. We've got some really large ones down here that we get time we'll work on those but um, deciding how big your container is how deep it is is going to determine how many plants you can the deeper your container the more root space the more plants you can stuff in here the less deep your container so you don't want to go by so much of many plants in because you've got less root space so all those things you have to think about and if you're watering how much are you going to take care of this? If you're not, you're not going to be home very much this summer, you're going to want to put some plants that can handle that kind of situation. Um, so lots of things to think about. So before we go any farther, though, I do we want to talk a little bit about soil um, in a minute. But I want to put this in. So this is something that we add to a lot of our basket container mixes. So right here, we just have a nice potting soil. We make our own potting, or have our own potting soil made at Willow Bay Gardens. It's got the perlite, the compost, um, sphagnum peat moss, and uh, other things in it. Not too many other things, but most of those things. But we like to put a little extra um, pore fiber in it. So this does have some pore fiber, but during the hot summer months, this is what's going to help keep your containers from drying out. So we sell this, this comes through Miller's out of Logan, and um, it's compacted. It's actually coconut husks, and it's very compacted. And so you can see it looks really dry. So to be able to use this, I either got it grated, which is very nasty, it's dusty and everything, 
or I can put it in a bucket of water, which is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to drop this right in the bucket of water. And that is going to soak up while we're talking. So it's something that you need to think about doing before you get too far down the road. One to make sure that it would start to soak up, and then I can use it and mix it into my thing. You can also use it in your, um, use your flower beds. A lot of people, when they're planting up perennials, especially if they know they've got really rough soil, clay, or really sandy, they want to be able to pull the moisture in, and some plants really like have moisture, constant moisture. They will put those, that coconut fiber, which I'll show to you in a minute, and they'll put it right in with the plant. So, something to think about. Now let's talk a minute about what makes a good container. You can see these are made out of plastic. You can get lots of beautiful ceramic containers. Uh, metal ones are kind of in. You've got like, um, some of the corrugated metal ones, those are great too. Um, you need to maybe think about where it's going to go and what you want to put in it, what kind of look you want. Whiskey barrels make great containers. Um, and then also, you're going to think about the depth. What do you use it? We've got little ones. We sell some little ceramic ones that are not very deep. They are great for like succulents because succulents don't get a lot of roots. These plants, especially if you do like a grass. Um, I brought one of these. This is a water rice chara. You might have heard of it. These guys like plenty of water and they like a lot of roots. So putting this one in here like this by the end of the season is going to fill up this um, all this root space. So you got to think about that as far as your containers. And then the other thing that is so important so make sure you have a hole, holes at the bottom of your containers. Check these ones. Yep, right there. <laughs> Lots of containers that you buy just at the store, like Walmart or something, will have knockout holes. Please make sure you knock those out. <clears throat> I've had people just plant in them, and then pretty soon, man, my plant is just drowning in there because there's no place for the water to go. <clears throat> Now, if you needed to create a little bit of drainage because you've got a hard situation, you can do that by putting just a little gravel in the bottom. Will help, but you're still going to have to be so careful with your walls. So it's just best to have drainage. If you want to do a pool pond that doesn't have drainage in it, you just get you. My husband's really good with his drill, and he has like a tiny bit drill. You can drill through pretty much anything. Nice glass container um, just to make you a few holes to the drainage. So, drainage is important. Say that with me drainage is important. Okay. So, let's talk a little bit about a planting mix. <clears throat> um, a lot of people. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, technical, technical check here. Um, planting mixes are important. Um, there are lots of ones to buy out there, and I think you just you just want something that has a good feel to it. It's got plenty of the perlite or vermiculite in it because that's the white stuff that you see in the mixes. That allows some air for the roots. It creates air space in the soil for the roots to be able to spread. I've had experience where we don't have enough perlite or vermiculite in it, and it makes a difference. The plants just do not thrive, and the roots just cannot take off without that space. Um, try to look at the soils before you buy them, if you can. If there's a chance that you can buy it in a smaller container, or they have a sample for you to look at, we use to have a bag open that you want to look at our soil. Um, and then feel it, and feel it. Now, a lot of people ask me, do I have to put new soil in here? Um, depends on your container. If you have a really large container, then you can empty it out 
at least halfway in the soil. Uh, I recommend at least refreshing your soil to a certain point every year. Um, it just gets depleted of its nutrients. Your watering, your watering, it washes it all out. It just business happens. So if you have a large container, refresh it halfway. You have a small container, just dump that old soil out into your garden. Soil, you would change it up a little bit, and then you have this full, put a brand new soil in your container. The plants will be happier this year. Um, we have had a, someone come up and bought some late season soil from just a box store. That wasn't really effective. So make sure you're getting a good soil. Is that, it's just key. Um, like I said, some of ours has this coconut fiber in it. And it's just really good. The other thing about coconut fiber, see, you can see our coconut fiber start. Can you see me over here? Can you see it? It's starting to come apart. This might be really hard. It might be waiting a while for this to come apart. But the thing about this is it is retains water. It soaks up the water. And it really holds the water during the hot summer months. And then after a few years, it starts to break down in your soil. And so then it starts a feeding process, which is also too. So you get two benefits. It contains water, and then it actually starts to feed your soil and your plants. So it's kind of a, it's got a twofold benefit, which is awesome. So we really love coconut. It's really a great, uh, great thing to add to your soil and to your, to your plants and to your soil as well. So, um, Okay. <laughs> um, so we talked a little bit about soil level. You don't want your soil clear up to the very top of your basket. We left it down just a little bit here because when I water, I want to be able to have a little bit of water stay on top and be able to seep down in there. If you have it clear to the top and I water, the water is just going to run right off the top. So I want a little bit of a lip, an inch. Um, inch and a half. You could even go two. The other thing you don't want to do is you don't want to pack your soil in there. I see a lot of people, and maybe it's just us, and it's maybe it's our mom thing. We want to pat the soil. <laughs> just don't do that. Just leave it loose. Lots of times, if it's set there for a little while, you want to just kind of refresh it and um, loosen it up a little bit. And you'll see when we go to plant that we're just going to make a hole. You're just going to want to make a hole tuck that plant in there and then just tuck it around and don't be like packing that soil in. It does the same thing as not having enough perlite in there. It's gonna make those roots so they really can't expand. So you wanna just tuck your plants in there. Um, like we talked about early on, if you've got a lot of root space, you could plant these pretty tight. So these deeper pots that I have, I could put them in pretty tight. Um, I don't always want to do that. For a couple reasons. If you have a lot of plants in there, it takes a lot more water. <laughs> Sometimes you just, it's hard to keep them watered. The more plants you have, the thirstier it's going to be. Um, the other thing too is sometimes it's just nice to let each plant have its space. And when you get it way too full, it just becomes crowded. Um, it kind of depends on what kind of a gardener you are. I'm kind of a tidy gardener, and I like a little bit of space. I like to be able to see each plant. I want it to fill out, but I also want to be able to see that I have this and this in there. If you are a, I call them a messy gardener, where you love just it full and whatever, and if you've got enough volume here for root, then pack it in there tight. You do it how you like. I mean, this is your, this is your container. You make it look like you. So... And the other thing that you need to think about, too, when you're deciding how you're going to plant this is, do I want height in the back? Is this going to set up against a, uh, a wall, or is it going to set out in the middle? So if it's going to set in the middle, I'm going to put something tall right here in the middle, and I'm going to build it out from here, something not quite so tall, then I want my trailing. And you've probably heard it, um, thriller, filler, spiller, 
or upright mounding and trailing. But you could do, you could have something coming off all the sides or you can have it just coming off of two sides. You can decide how that looks. If I'm gonna put this up against my wall, like these, some of these containers are gonna be, then I'm gonna put my height, my tall thing, my thriller back here. And then I'll put probably, this one I'll probably put three mounders right here to fill my fillers in the middle there. And then I'll put my spillers around the sides like this and not back here because I don't want, I don't want to smash them right here. So full coming off the front here, mounders and then the height in the back, if that's the way I'm going to do it. So you, you have to decide early on which way you want this to look. Um, and then also too, in the thinking of it, if you want something that's going to spill over the edge, I'm just going to see if I've got something. This plant is going to, this is a, a vinca. Um, I love the variegation in it, but I'm going to want it, when I plant it, it's going to go over the edge. And so I'm going to plant it going this direction, like this, so that it goes this way. If I plant it going this way, because it kind of wants to go that way, and it's going to take off across my basket here, but I want it to go this way. So you can totally do that with, with your spillers. Um, even some of your upright ones, like these are fuchsias, and this says it wants to be upright, but if I want it to lean, <laughs> maybe not call it trailing, but like lean over, then I could plant it the direction that I want it to go. So don't be afraid. Not everything has to go this way. You can plant it going off this way to make it go the direction you're looking it to go. So, all right, got, got that? Okay, so then let's talk about how we're going to choose the right plants. And if I hope that when you go to a nursery, um, if you come to ours, that we're giving you um, direction on that. We're helping you pick out the right plants for your sun for your shade whatever lighting you have and so you're going to really need to know how much light i'm going to get and sometimes that's hard you're like i'm not at my house in the middle of the day so maybe you need to like set a camera or something i don't know you decide but you need to kind of know are you going to have hot west sun or is it shady most of the day um what kind of light are you going to get um Sometimes it's hard. Now I have a west facing house with a big maple tree. And so I get no sun in the, no, no morning sun. About midday I get a little bit of filtered sun. And then I get total shade until the gets west sun drops. And then I get hot, intense sun. And that's a little tricky. Those kind of situations are tricky. But for the most part, most plants can either handle hot sun which means that they can handle west, hot, baking, they can handle a little bit dry. Or you have sun plants, which like at least six hours of sun um, to be happy. Most of the time they might be a little bit, um, they'll be green, like geraniums and things can be green in a less sun situation, but they won't always bloom like you want them to. So you need to remember that. And then you have plants that can handle either or, sun or shade. Um, I was going to see if I had anything. This one is one of those plants. This is called an ageratum, um, blue horizon. Gets these little tuft of the cutest blue flowers you've ever seen, just little balls on top. It can handle, it probably can handle more shade than hot sun, but it can handle some sun. So a good example of one that can handle either or. So if you're not quite sure, that's maybe the safer ones. Ivy geraniums fit in that category. Um, there's some vines that fit in that category. Um, some of the geraniums do that. And so if you're not quite sure, that might be a safe bet if you don't know how much sun or shade you're going to get is do one that has, a, has both. Um, the other thing to think about, too, is, you know, are they upright? Are they trailing? the spiller thriller and hopefully when you're going to the nursery there they're helping you with that also you can always read the tags that's why there's tags in every single plant there should be to tell you basically like this one's going to tell me it likes the sun 
it'll bloom from early summer to autumn and um, it'll get 32 inches tall. Those are all important things to know. Um, this one, it happens to be a perennial and I love to use perennials in my containers. I know um, not everybody does, and I do a mix of them. I'll do, contain, I'll do annuals and perennials. Um, there are some perennials that have their own bloom time, but if you look for some that have an all summer bloom time, like Gara, um, Rubecchia, which is like your um, black-eyed Susans, um, Echinacea have a really long bloom time, put those kind of things in there and they'll match what your annuals are doing. And so you'll get a long bloom season even out of some of these perennials. Um, but don't be afraid to read the tags. Find out how tall it's going to be, what it, what it wants. Um, there are some plants, too, that like a lot of food. And so if you are not really good at feeding them, you might think about whether you want to plant those or not. Martha Washington geraniums, um, petunias, wave petunias, are really heavy feeders. They got to be fed regularly or um, they don't bloom like you want them to. Um, the other thing, and I know we see a lot of beautiful petunia baskets, which are awesome. They, they are showstoppers, but you've got to keep feeding them and you've got to be careful um, during the summer, late summer, like end of July, lots of times you'll see a tobacco budworm that will eat the blooms. Wash, um, geraniums will do that too. But, um, and then all of a sudden you're like, my petunias just quit blooming. So you've got to really watch for that. Is, um, so an insecticide on it. Thuricide is one that people use a lot for um, the tobacco budworm. Um, I've used a neem oil, which is a little more organic. Always not quite as effective, but if you're diligent at it, it will be effective. You just have to use the organic ones a little more, more regularly. Um, but if you don't want to worry about that, then don't plant petunias. <laughs> they like to be fed and they like to be watered. So just things to think about as you're doing it. Also, how much care do you want to give this in trimming and deadheading? Petunias like to be deadheaded. They just look better that way. There's some of the newer brands like Supertunias, and some of the, the Vista series, if you see those, they don't need to be deadheaded as much, but they just look better deadheaded. Um, geraniums look better deadheaded. Um, there's, I'm trying to think if there's other things that definitely, this guy doesn't. He doesn't, his blooms will just fall right off. Same with impatience. If you're planting impatience, they just generally fall off. In fact, I just take the hose and squirt off the dead blooms. Um, so not a lot of work. So think about how much time do I want to put into this container? Am I going to be on vacation a lot? Do I have the time to deadhead it, to take care of it, to water it, to feed it? It is a commitment. So just some things to think about. And is it going to be hot and dry or cool and moist? The other thing too is um, if you're putting this up against your house, what color is your house? Think about that. Um, is my house red? I'm probably not going to want to put strong red color combos in here. Um, if it's white, then maybe I do want to do reds and purples. Um, if my house is red, I probably would want to do some purples and some whites. Something that's going to give a contrast to where this is. If it's out in the middle of, uh, on the deck, then go with your favorite colors. And, um, I don't think there's any wrong color combo. I love them all. Um, I'm into pink and oranges. I think those are great. Um, lately, I've seen a lot of people doing red, white, and pink. That wouldn't be my first choice, but you know, you can do, this is yours. Make it yours. Reds and purples are always nice. Orange and purples are perfect. Um, but you decide. Don't get hung up, though, on being like, everything's got to match. I, it does look pretty if you got all shades of purple in there, <laughs> but something to add some contrast. A uh, yellow and a white is always important in there because it just makes the other things pop. So the other thing um, that you could think about too is maybe your color doesn't come with bloom. 
So I brought a couple of these because I love to put these in shade baskets, in part sun baskets. You can see that I'm not going to get a bloom on this caladium, but I'm getting this strong color with the foliage. I absolutely love this one. And these guys come in like pinks and reds and whites, and you're just getting this beautiful foliage color. Um, this is another nice one. This is a coleus. This is new. We haven't had this one here. It's called burning bush. Um, but the coleus comes in all different colors. You get yellows and reds, um, even some purple tones. I've got one back at the nursery that it's almost like the sun hits it and it's almost like a vibrant, like shiny. And it's got pinks and reds and green tones. So put some color in with the foliage. That way, especially in your shade basket, if you don't always get a lot of blooms, you still got color. And these, this color stays all year long. So it's really sweet. It's really awesome. Another one of my favorite shade plants for some color is just using these um, gold creeping jennies. And this is a perennial, um, but it adds this lovely yellow color, which in shade baskets really pops. If you think about um, a shade basket, it's going to be a little bit dark there, and so you want bright colors. You don't really want to put like dark colors in your shade basket too much. They're going to just get lost in the shade. So just some things to think about when you're deciding how, what you're going to plant in there. Um, like I said, a nice mix of perennials and annuals is fun. The other perk, the other plus to doing perennials is the end of this year when this basket's done and it's about to freeze and I'm ready to get rid of it. I can just pull those perennials out and I can put them in my flower bed outside and they're going to survive. Or you can also leave them in this pot and you've got a good chance they may come back next year. Um, not always true because sometimes if we have a particularly cold winter, you may freeze the roots all the way through. And so that can, and, and going into a dry if this is dry into a dry condition in a dry winter, you'll probably lose those perennials if you leave them in your basket. Now, if you want to, I have people that keep their perennials in their basket. And if you want to do that, I would suggest that you give this basket some protection, especially if we have a really cold, cold winter. And you can either bring it inside your garage for part of the winter, or you could wrap it and protect it, insulate it outside just to protect the roots is what you're worried about mostly, um, freezing solid. This last year we had a mild winter and so you wouldn't have had a problem keeping a perennial in your pot. Or you can just take it out, like we said, put it into your flower bed, and then start again next year. Because that's the fun part. There's always next year. You get to do something different next year. So that's fun. Green. I'm going to check in. Oh, we're going to check in on our so here's my coconut fiber. You can see it's starting to, boy, it's really wet. I'm going to squeeze it out just a little bit. But you can see how it started to fall apart. There's no way I would have got that brick apart. Um, had a, one of my dear son-in-law tried to grate one of these. Oh my gosh, he was sneezing and <laughs> it was really bad. So don't try that. I don't recommend it. This is much easier. If you just got to have a little patience. But you can see right now my brick is like, I'll squeeze that out. It's pretty much, look how easy it is. And I'm just going to put a little bit of, um, if you had a wheelbarrow, you could mix it together into your soil. But in these ones, I just will do just a little bit of mixing. That one still needs a little soaking. Let me see if I can squeeze out another handful or two. But you also can just put a, a coating on the top. And then just mix it in. Anything that you can give it. Like I said, our soil already has some of it in there. So, um, but at the nursery when we're making basket soil, we almost do, um, we do like a three parts, three parts soil potting mix to one part core fiber just to give it some extra things. Um, I think it's really critical if you're doing a sun basket, hot basket, that you, that you put core fiber in there. Um, 
maybe not so critical with your shade baskets because they're just not going to dry out and suck up the water quite as much. So regular potting soil might be just okay for your shade baskets because you don't want them to retain the moisture and just kind of rot. Um, and patients are really bad about doing that. Um, and some of the other ones just don't like their feet to be wet all the time. So I can't itch my nose. <laughs> um, so that, so let's talk about watering now that we've put just a little bit of that core fiber in there. Um, when the temperature outside is like 70 degrees, you're going to be watering probably every three days or so, every three or four days, depending on if you're in full sun or if you're in a shady condition. Um, when the temperatures start getting to 80 degrees, you're probably looking at watering every other day or every two days. Then um, when we start to get 90, and we will because we live in Utah and it's going to be hot in the summer, um, then you're probably looking at watering every day. 100, you might have to do it a couple times a day. Um, depending on where they're at. The other thing that will help immensely is if you can get a saucer or something to put underneath, and you've seen it, you can just get a cheap plastic one or you can get a really fancy one um, to put under there, and that catches the runoff from when you're watering up here, and it allows the plants to re-soak that back up and come back in. So that will save you a little bit of time, especially when it gets really hot. You may not have to water every day. Um, when your watering is crucial, don't water in the middle of the hot day um, if you can help it. I know sometimes you just can't help it, but um, early morning watering or evening watering, not super late, but just as it's starting to cool off, is really the best time to water because then you've got um, the plants can soak it in and it just doesn't evaporate, you know, right there. And your water and your saucer will stay just a little bit longer for the plants to re soak that back up. So that's just a little bit about um, what you can expect when you're watering. Hot sun plants, you're awfully going to water more. Shady plants, you're going to water less. So just some things to think about there. Um, and then it's critical to feed, to feed your baskets, whether it's a hanging basket or a pot or whatever. If you want the optimum, um, basket feeding is crucial. Now, if you've got petunias and stuff, it's really important. It's like vital. But just think about yourself. Do you want to just live on a water diet? I don't. I, I like my bread and butter and <laughs> some veggies once in a while, and my fruit and chocolate brownies and all those things. And so when you feed, that's just what you're giving your plants. You're giving them more of a balanced meal instead of just water all the time. And you might say, well... And our soil does come with a little bit of fertilizer in it. It's mixed in. And some of them will put a time-released fertilizer in that. And that's great. But it's not going to last you the whole summer, especially when you're watering every day. You are washing those nutrients out. And so it's critical that you keep putting them back in. Now, if you're in a time, have a time-release fertilizer, we have one um, made up in Logan. It's called Nutrigel but you can get like Osmocote and some of those. They actually have a polymer in them that helps hold some of the water in there and helps hold the fertilizer as you're putting it back in. It kind of helps hold it around there so the roots can use it. And so that's a really good thing. If you put a time-release fertilizer as you're mixing it in, I should have brought a bottle, but um, you just mix it in right before you plant, and that's going to help give it a constant feed, but you're still going to want to feed it. So... Um, the key to feeding, though, is doing it. We all start out really good. We're always like, yeah, I can feed it, I can keep it. And we use the, at the nursery, I use a foliar feed, which means that it's, it goes in, the leaves are able to take it in through the leaves, through the top. It also goes into the soil and it can feed the roots. But, um, Foliar is, if you got both, that's ideal. And so I usually use a liquid fertilizer, um, and it's just like a tablespoon to a gallon. You can put it in like a spray situation, or you could use it in a watering can, whatever works best for you. But the thing is to do it. Um, pick a day. I usually do it once a week. So pick a day that you're like, usually I'm home on Saturday evening or 
my Sunday morning early is quiet, I'll just do it then. And so you just pick a day and consistently do it. And that'll help a ton. And then just decide, you know, is it, I'm going to do it once a week? Am I going to do it every other week, once a month? And that'll, then that'll help you determine how much feed you're going to give them. Because most of the feeds have a recipe, like on the back, we'll say one tablespoon, a gallon for every two weeks or whatever it is. So just follow the instructions on your fertilizer. Um, the one that we sell at the nursery is made by Bicor out of Logan, and it's a really good um, organic fertilizer. Um, and that's, you know, you need to decide that too. Am I going to do organic or am I going to do just a miracle grow? And I advocate ours, but I advocate just feeding it. So just feed it. Just do it. Just do it. So. Um, and then, like we talked about later on, um, you're going to, you can't just plant them and just let them go, right? There's going to, you're going to have to give them some care. So some plants need some deadheading. Some plants will need some trimming. It might start to look a little ragged come the summer. Um, there's some plants, I'm trying to think, this is one of my favorite hot plants, and it's called Nurembergia. And it gets these little blue cup flowers on the top. And it might start to look a little ragged when it gets hot. And it's just one of those plants that I can just give a haircut. So I'll just trim them off the top and it'll kind of help rejuvenate that. And this is such a good filler. Um, this one blooms purple. They come in white or purple. Um, and, it, and I just tuck it in between everything. Um, and it just loves the hot heat situation. So, but it's one of those that you can definitely just give it a haircut. Um, other ones, like on the Gara here, you're not going to want to just give this a haircut because it's just going to keep blooming right up the stem. Each one of these is just going to be blooms. And this is such a fun one because it gives you kind of the look of a grass, but it also has blooms just coming up all the time. And so um, I put these often in pots and I always get comments on them like, what is that plant? Because it just... It handles it hot. It looks cool. It does like moisture. It can't be exceptionally dry. And this one um, is called Rosy Jane, so it's got some pink and white on the blooms. It's really super cute. And you got this fun foliage color too. So, so you, um, when you're buying your plants, I would really suggest that you kind of ask questions. You know, does this plant need to be deadheaded? Does this plant um, like to be moist? Does this one like to be dry? Um, we usually say, you know, they don't like to have wet feet or they do like to be on the drier side. So don't be afraid to ask questions, especially when you're buying your plants. Hopefully they can give you the information that you need to, um, to be successful to help you with um, to doing this. So um, do we have any questions we need to, that we didn't talk about? No, I don't think I would put them on a foliar. Oh, so the question was, did are Epsom salts a foliar feed? And I think I think it goes into the soil. I wouldn't put it on the foliar on the on the leaves. Um, I would put it in the soil because it's going to help. I think the reason that you do it is it helps the pH of your soil, and so you're going to want to put that in your soil. It's a more of a root stimulator root uptake you know kind of thing it's going to affect the up way if your ph in your soil is way off then lots of times your roots won't uptake the nutrients that are in the soil and so you'll find them yellowing or just not thriving and that the epsom salts i think is goes into the soil to help that ph so that the plant can uptake the nutrients so i don't think i would put it on the yeah Oh, oh yeah. So the question is, can you, if you have a really large pot, can you put something in the bottom and not fill it all with soil? Um, yes, yes, we've done that. Especially if you've got a super tall pot, there's no way those roots are going to go all the way to the bottom. And so you can fill it with, um, I've seen people do like packing peanuts, um, old pots like some of these plastic pots in the bottom. Don't put anything in that's going to be toxic or you know leach into your soil. Um, 
if you've got really tall skinny pots, which are definitely skinnier at the bottom and go up like this, put some weight in the bottom because they can get really top heavy and then you're gonna be um, tipping it over. So some rocks, some gravel to give you some weight at the bottom. I know it makes it really hard to move them, but that's gonna help. But yes, you can definitely, you don't have to fill the whole thing with soil. It's better for the plants, but if you've got an exceptionally large pot, you can put something in the bottom. So, yes. Okay. Okay, we're going to take a, just a 10 second break and then we're going to go ahead and plant these two pots here in the sun and shade kind of thing. So stay tuned. Did I accidentally shut it off? Probably longer than 10 seconds. Oh, thank you very much. I'm just going to open it up. <laughs> just had a minute, huh? What? Is that a problem? Are we ready? What? <laughs> the whole time? Or just now? Can you flip it around? This one? Yeah. <laughs> Is it good now? <laughs> okay, are we done? Are we back? Okay. That was a little longer than 10 seconds. We had a few technical difficulties. Um, so this part right here, we're going to do in the shade um, and this one we'll do in the hot sun these are pots that are that are weaver basins that they're going to um, use around their new facility here and so we've just picked some they've got three that are going to be shade and three that are going to be sun and we'll just do a couple of them here so this is um, the caladium this one's called white christmas and um, it's just going to you can see it's got a lot of new growth coming it's just going to keep going it can handle total shade. You can handle a little dappled sun, but it can handle total, total shade. Um, and it's, I, I love caladiums, and they can handle being a little bit dry too. They're not real picky. So you can pop this out. And you can see the roots on this one looks pretty good. We don't want anything that's really root bound. If it is, well, then we're gonna loosen it up. But this one looks really good. Um, I grabbed a pot back here so that I can pull some out because once you start putting your soil in or your plants in, sometimes you end up with way too much soil. So I'm going to just pull some out because this guy's got his own soil and roots. 
<clears throat> and I'm just going to plant them the same level that he was in the pot. And you can see I'm not pressing him down. I'm just going to tuck him in like this. So this is going to be the back of my pot. I'm going to build this so that this is the back and I'm going to go frontward like this. Okay. So you can see that I've got that there. Um, I usually try to put, I think I'm going to put this guy on the front. I usually try to put my main pieces in first and then I can um, go from there. So I want this guy to trail off the front right here. This is called, this is a vinca and it's actually can be a perennial. It's a, not a real hardy perennial, but if you had a, you're in zone six or something like that, you could definitely use it. Um, and I'm going to put him, and this is where I talk, and he doesn't have really strong roots to the bottom. So I'm just going to take some of that off the bottom there so I don't have to dig such a deep hole. And what I want to do is I'm going to point him going off this direction like this. because I want him just to flow off the front there. And so I'm putting my main pieces in here. Um, this is one of my very favorite fuchsias ever, mostly because it has this, I hope you guys are okay with this colored foliage. <laughs> it will bloom, but it also has this really cool color, coloring on the foliage. This is an autumnal fuchsia, and it'll trail over like this. So I'm gonna plant just a couple of them. I'm gonna move this bucket here real quick so I don't run onto it. And I'm going to have them going off the side right here so that this will be my trailing off the side. Um, and lots of times we really recommend that if you, and you can see the roots on this isn't really bad, so I'm just going to pull this a little bit off. I'm not going to break the roots. And I'm just going to tuck them in like this. And I want them just to go off the side. You can see I'm getting a little extra soil, so I'm not going to try to put that all, shove it all back in. Um, the other thing to do lots of times if you're planting is to save your tags. And at the nursery, we'll put them in along the side here. And if you tuck that tag in like this, down along the side, you won't, it won't interrupt, interrupt the growing of the plant. If you leave it up, it's going to. If you tuck it down in, and then um, if you really like that plant, then save the tag and use it next year. Um, if you don't, then don't save the tag because <laughs> you'll forget about it. Um, this one I'm just going to take a little bit off because it's not clear to the bottom. I'm going to pull a little soil out of there. And as you can see, I'm making, I'm directing it off to the side. I don't want it to, I don't want it to go into the middle. I want it to go off the side this way. Just kind of swoop it around so it looks even. And make sure all the roots are well, sometimes they tend to stick out. So just make sure they're covered up as you're doing that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to put in here, and these are going to be middles are, why did I pull white? This would be a very white container. <laughs> you like white? Maybe <laughs> um, I was going to do this in there. Would that work in there? Which one do you like? Do you like that better than the? Yeah, maybe, so. maybe that too. The coleus in here, because those, um, the white, I had the girls pulling for me last night and I wasn't paying attention to what they were all pulling. So um, the white might be too much, but some people really like white containers. You know, maybe you're going to do it for a wedding or something like that. And you could do them all white or you could do them all pink or, um, Lots of people like to end up doing containers for and things like that and um, and that's great and you can use the wedding colors and that's all fun and everything but then remember that that wedding only lasts for one day and then you've got to look at it for the whole rest of the year so just make sure you're doing um, something that you can stand to look at for the rest of the year. I'll put a couple of these in here just like this. I'm just going to tuck them in. I don't want to shove them in too much. Um, hopefully these guys, hmm. and then you might get them in and you might be like, you know what, I want to scoot this. So I want to scoot this a little farther back, I think. 
I don't want it like right in front of my caladium. I'm looking at it going, I don't like the way that looks. And the best thing about it is you can rearrange. Don't be afraid to rearrange. It does take a little there. I like that a little bit better because it's going to give me a little space to, to um, do that there. Um, the other thing that I could do, and I know I'm putting quite a bit in here and you can choose how much you want to put in, but I probably would put, these guys are going to get fairly tall and I would probably just tuck one of these back behind here. And it's going to give me some blue, some extra green in here. And if I just put one of those in there, that just, see that just adds a little bit there. Then I've got all this space in here, which is going to be my, um, be some of my filler. And I would just use impatience in there. And I just brought a variety of impatience. And so sometimes I'll just grab them and decide, you know, what color is going to look good in there. I want to do reds. I think I just want to do a whole mix, don't you think? It would just be, um, you don't have to like, some people are very symmetrical and you can be very symmetrical about it. It's up to you. Um, being at the nursery, we get a, a little bit um, spoiled because I can pick from any, anyone that I want. <laughs> I know sometimes when you take them home, you're like, I can't do that. I can't just pick anyone that I want. But um, yeah, so you just put another, probably I maybe want that salmon one in there. So this one here, I'm being a little symmetrical about my colors, but you don't have to. You could just mix it up however you wanted it to do. These guys look good on roots. They're not, in fact, I really would rather them be clear to the bottom, but you don't want them like circling. If they're circling at the bottom, you want Maybe I'll show you in another plant that's circling. But I'm just going to dig a little hole and just tuck it right in there. You can see I'm, I'm putting quite a few in here, but yet there's still a little bit of space for them to be their own selves. The other thing to think about too, um, and not so much on impatience, they kind of are pretty tough, but if you're planting marigolds or anything like that, it's really wise just to pee when you plant them because it's going to send all that energy of that plant down to um, the roots, and that's where we want the where, where we want things to happen right now. Is we really want root growth and not um, them to worry about flowering right now. You know, giving some good growth to the roots um, is going to be key to later on, and then they can flower. So. If in doubt, I would say just pinch those off. But like I said, impatience aren't really fussy about that. But if I had another, um, if I wanted to do geraniums, uh, yeah, you could do geraniums, but marigolds and some of those bigger flowers that I want them to root better, then I would do those. So yeah, you can just do something like that. Pretty simple. And don't be afraid of the colors of, I just think all the colors go together well. So. Let's work on this basket here. And this one's a little bit more for, this is going to be hot sun. These are going to be shade. Um, for my thriller in this one, I've chosen Agastache. Um, this is a newer one, but they usually come in like oranges, uh, reds, yellows, and they have a wonderful smell. It's like a, um, it's hummingbird mint. So it's kind of a minty, but some of them almost smell like root beer. Some smell like bubble gum kind of fun. But this one is blue and I really liked it. You could have done um, you could have done one too that's or you could do a salvia if you wanted the same kind of blue color. This one's telling me it's going to get 14 to 20 inches tall. So that's going to be perfect for um, what I want here. When I'm when I'm looking at height, I sometimes look at how tall the container is. The taller your container, the more height you can put at the top. Sometimes if you get a really tall container and you get um, a short top, it looks a little dorky. So, so this one's got roots. I'm going to pull a little bit out. I don't want to break too much off of this one. I'm going to pull a little soil out so I don't have too much going on there. And he's a little floppy, you can see. And so I'm going to 
um, plant him a, just a little bit deeper, just so he has some support. So when I push that around there, it's giving him a little more support so he's not flopping around. And I've put him to the back, but I haven't put him right back against the edge, so he's got a little root space to go in the back there. So that's gonna be my thriller, okay, in the back. And then, what did I decide? Let's put, um, these guys are gonna be, this is a lantana. They love it hot. Um, and this one is a trailing. I want him to go out the sides. So I've got two of them, they're in a gold. So I've got the blue here. I've got the gold coming off the sides. This is gonna be what's coming off. And I think I'm gonna put these, see roots, not bad on roots. Hopefully I'll show you one that's kind of bound. I'm gonna put them a little more front and center, not clear to the front, but I wanna put some height right here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put them, push them forward just a little bit. You get to decide how this looks. This is the best part. It's like, a, you know, building something fun and you get to see what it looks like later on. So you can see I'm planting these at an angle because I want them to go off that side like that. Um, sometimes lantanas don't bloom until it really gets hot. They love it in like Arizona and some of those places, they're like small shrubs there. But here in Utah, they're not. They're, they kind of die off because we're not quite that hot all season long. Um, look and see what else I've got going on over here that I've thought about. So this is another one of my, the fun plants that not everybody knows about. This is called Gumfrina. We absolutely love Gumfrina. It gets these little um, balls of flowers on the top and it loves it hot. And you're like, well, it doesn't look like much now. Well, you just wait until August. This is gonna be the, whoo, what is that plant? And so, um, and I want it to be like a standout in the back of this pot here. So I could even put two of them. And this, this is only gonna get 18 inches tall. So I'm gonna put them back here because they're gonna be a little bit taller. I'm gonna show you the roots on these. These have got more roots. You can see how they're starting to circle like that. And so I'm gonna just open them up like that before I plant them. That way it'll, it'll train those roots to start to go down instead of start to circle around the pot or just keep circling and not go anywhere. And I can just put them right together. You can plant two of these little packs together because you want a, a little more statement there. And I just tuck them in, I'm not um, packing them in or anything. And so you're gonna come to Weaver Basin and say, what is that plant? <laughs> so those are gonna be a little bit of height right here. And they, they go up, but they also kind of just, they just, they're kind of funky. They just do their own thing. I, I love them. So, so there you go. That's my statement there. And then I'm going to put um, one of my other most favorite plants for hot is zinnias. And they come in so many fun colors. And this is a new one this year. I just really like it. This cherry bicolor. And I think we're sold out at the nursery. So sorry, you can't go get any. Um, but this is going to be my filler. And I, I'll probably just put, um, I wouldn't have to put all of these in here, but I could. I'm looking at this, trying to decide, do I just want three in there? Do I just want two in there? And their roots look pretty good. See, they're not starting to circle. They've, in fact, they've got a nice, healthy set of roots. Um, these are perfusion zinnias. Love, love, love them. They'll fill out and be nice and bushy. The colors are vibrant. and um, and maybe just three would be enough there. Sometimes I do get over carried away and put too many in there. So <laughs> I've tried to be like, not so many, not so many. And then off the front, we're gonna put, um, this is Vinca. I don't know if you've heard of Vinca before. Um, loves it hot, just kind of got a fun glossy. So the flowers look a lot like the impatience. Um, you can see it. This is just a mix, so I don't know what color we're going to get for sure, but it'll be all right. Um, 
and these are trailing. So you've got this Mediterranean variety that trails. It's kind of moundy traily, and I'm going to put this coming off the front here. Um, so there's ones that are more upright. They're, they get pretty tall, but these are trailing. <clears throat> and I think I'll just put a couple. They don't like to be super wet. They, in fact, they prefer a little bit drier situation. How many am I going to put here? I, I don't know that answer. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how strong of, I think we want to, put, maybe we'll put all four of them. How many did I bring? I think we'll put all four of them there just because they're, they can sometimes be a little weak if it's not hot and they get too much water. So maybe between four of them, they'll look like two of them. But they are super fun. Um, I know that some of the university have, have done entire vinca beds, like the have the whole thing, vinca. Um, I could be done right there, but I wanted to put just a couple of these little purple Nirembergia in there. They don't get very tall. They're maybe eight inches tall. And I think I'd want to put just a couple of them right there, just to give them a little bit of... And the other thing I love about these is they've got a different texture. So you've got a little different texture to your foliage. You can see they're pretty rooted, so I'm gonna lose. And let's see, we could just stick them right there. So give us a little purple, because we've got I think we got a little bit of pink going on here. I guess we got purple coming up here, but and I think that will I think that's gonna fill in nicely. I'm gonna leave a little space there because I don't want it to be like so full that they're competing too much. These are gonna fill out right here and hopefully just spill over the edge. This lantana just kind of goes out like this. These guys are gonna go up and kind of through. These guys are gonna be up. Um, I didn't mention this, but the, the zinnias are starting to bud. You can see on the top um, like this. And I could go ahead and just pinch that. The beauty of pinching the top of these <clears throat> it's going to make send all the energy to these little laterals right there and so it's going to make a bushier plant even though this one's looking pretty good because it's got a lot going on already but it would make these bush out even more which would be a sweet thing to fill up this whole center a little bit more um, but there's some plants especially if they look like a stick i don't have one here but if they really look like a stick like sometimes marigolds do you want to really pinch the top so that it create some bush and a thicker, heavier plant. So anyway, there you go. That's kind of what I would do for a hot thing. Did we have any questions on, on what, okay, on what we're doing here? <laughs> um, when you talk about um, how much sun, full sun versus wet sun versus shade? Yes. So the question is how much sun is full sun and how much sun is part sun? How much is shade? Um, full sun is considered at least six hours of sun. So it could be um, it could be morning sun until like one or two, that's considered full sun. Um, <clears throat> hot sun is like pretty much all day sun. Like this basket could stand to be outside in the sun all day long, you know. Um, a, this basket could probably handle some morning shade, some morning sun, I'm sorry. So shady baskets can handle some morning sun because that sun is not as intense. And so um, <clears throat> shade is considered, or part sun, part shade would be less than six hours of sun, but at least some of the, that you know, shade, like four hours of sun and the rest shade. And then shade could be anything with no sun at all to just like a couple hours or dappled sun. So. But, there you go. Okay. I don't. Yeah, so we don't we don't pack the soil. <clears throat> when I fill up my pot, I just put it in. You might, you know, just let it settle a little bit, but no packing. If you pack that soil in there, it doesn't allow the roots to move and and then when you're putting your plants in, like like we did before, we just kind of dug a little hole and I can kind of demo again here. So I've got these two little guys right here. I just dug a little hole 
I put them in and I just tuck that soil around there. I don't push the soil down and pack them in because that allows those roots to be able to just really spread and go. So no packing early and no packing when you're planting. So. Caladium. So the question about the plants in the back of by the caladium. So you got a caladium here. These two are coleus, just the variegated leaves. Coleus sometimes will get a bloom on the top. It's insignificant. And I just pinch it because I want them to keep filling out like this. This other plant back here, I don't know if that was a question too. This is called an atum. Might get tall and flop just a little bit, but it gets these cute little fluffy blue blooms on it. So just one of those little plants that nobody knows a lot about. So okay. Um, what was the tall plant for the sun container? So the question about the tall plant for the sun container is an agastache. Or, and it's a little bit different one. Some of them are a little more airy. This one has got um, similar to little adder or blue boa. This one's called indigo. Astello indigo. So very blue. Um, here is the tag on it. And like we talked about earlier, if you want to stick your tags down in there so that you can remember what that plant was, you can totally tuck that tag down in there like this, and then you'll remember, if you liked it, keep the tag. If you didn't, throw it away, so. Um, please let them know that I will post a little bit of plants. Okay, online. yeah, so there's been questions about some of the plants that we've put in, and um, they, Weaver Basin will be glad to post these plants that we've used online, um, and give you a list if, if there's any questions, and if you want to ever come drop by and check them out, you can too, so. So the question is, is there a list that you could do thrillers, fillers and spillers? Um, there might be, <laughs> you might Google it. You might Google um, thrillers for sun, for a sun basket. I'm sure that there is one out there. Um, we try to organize our plants at the nursery as far as height. So you got this one is tall and this one is a moundy and this is a spiller. Um, and then lots of times the tags will tell you, you know, so if you read the tags on the back, it's going to tell you whether is this one telling me. So this one, so this is interesting. You can watch this. This one says height 16 to 20 inches. This is the lantana. And because it's in a container, it won't get that tall. Um, but the space that it needs this way is 32 by 36. So what is that telling me? It's telling me it's going to get a little bit of height, but it's going to be longer this way. So sometimes reading the tags, you'll find out, is this really more of a trailing plant or is this more of a, an upright plant? Okay. So yeah, but I, I'm sure you can Google some great ideas. Um, and you can even Google ideas for the way a basket might look and then come to the nursery and say, hey, I'm looking for, I'm looking for some impatience. I want some coleus, you know. You can go and ask specifically for those plants, so. So there's just a couple of questions about perennials in the back. I think you do answer a couple of them, but do you repot perennials in the um, The question is, can you repot your perennials um, every spring or out of this basket. I could this fall take this out of the basket and put it in my garden anywhere. You know, if I had a great sunny place, I could put it in there. Um, if I wanted to, I guess I could try to pot it, but I'd just change it up next year because I want my basket to look a little different. Um, I could leave it in this basket. You could leave it in this basket, trim it down in the fall, but early on we talked about if it's going to freeze very hard through this basket and the roots and everything is frozen all the way through the basket, chances are I might lose that plant. So um, you need to insulate it or cover it or something if you want to try to leave them in the basket. But I would just take it out and put it in my garden somewhere. I think that would be the best thing. So you got a twofold. You get a container look and then you put it in your being in next year, you go and get another perennial and put in there, and then you just build your garden that way. So easy. And then, uh, in the 
Thank you for your um, we talked about the review meeting every year. How do you do that with perennials? Um, it would be a little bit harder with your perennials. If you were to leave the perennials in the basket, it's harder to rejuvenate um, that soil. Um, you could take that perennial out. I would think with its soil, you could probably take that out and rejuvenate or just rejuvenate around it. Um, I would think it, it's going to be trickier for sure to do that, but um, you just have to work that out. And, and it's not crucial. I mean, it's not crucial every year to rejuvenate it. Um, it's just that lots of times in my situation, I have a container and then I pull all these out and then I put pansies in it in the fall and I'll put some bulbs in it and then I'll pull those all out and then my soil's getting really tired by then. <laughs> so it's nice to give it an up, uh, a refresh. So. Do you have any standout fragrant flowers that you did in the container? Mm, standout fragrant flowers for a container. Um, a bunch of these are pretty fragrant right here. <laughs> you smell them, this one's smelly. Um, trying to think if I have one that I really like. Agastache, I do really like the Agastache. Um, alyssum, put alyssum in containers and it's very fragrant. In fact, there's a trailing alyssum called Lobularia, very fragrant. Um, and it just blooms, blooms, blooms. It does tend, it doesn't handle the heat really well. So I didn't bring any here. Um, but it, it blooms. It's, it's a good smell. Um, another one that smells really good is stock. And I don't know if you can find that. I've sold out at the nursery, but it has a really fragrant smell. So it, and it would do okay in a container. So most annuals will do okay in a container. So if there's one that you like, um, another one that I love is Dalbert daisies. And there's a little yellow bloom. Um, um, I wish I could bring them all and show you all of them, but it's got a fragrance and it depends on if you like it or not. <laughs> so. Um, and then, what about It depends on which ones you plant. Um, you could do a rosemary arp, which is the most hardiest rosemary that we have, and you could you could do that. You could do an herb. You could definitely do an herb pot in here. That would be simple. Um, we should have done that. That would have been fun. I have some beautiful calendulas that are just about ready to bloom. You could do a lavender in there. Um, I would do probably a smaller lavender. We've got different sizes of lavenders, and I'd probably do a smaller one if you were to do a lavender in your pot. Um, there is a creeping rosemary called Huntington Carpet that would spill. It's not hardy here. It's marginally hardy here, so it wouldn't probably last over your winter, but if you're just planting as an annual situation, it would be okay. An herb basket would be way, way sweet. We should have done that. <laughs> um, is there, how early should I buy these to get a better selection? Or find that they buy your mother's day when they're super sold out of that? And that is the nurseries being sold out of the best stuff this year is the truth. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> Usually by Mother's Day, especially when we've had a warm spring like this and everybody's been quarantined and they're ready to get out, nurseries have been extremely busy and they're going to be low on stuff. And I'm sorry to say that. We do still have a few of these things. I just barely pulled all these last night. And so at our nursery, we do have some of these um, things that I knew, but I'm about out of Gumfrina and a few things. Um, usually by May 1st, for petunias, you could even do the last week of April. They can handle some cold. It kind of just depends on the weather that we're having, the kind of spring that we're having. Um, but petunias, alyssum, um, I'm trying to think of some other things. Some of the ones that are perennials, you could buy those early. You could buy those in the middle of April. Um, but some of the more tender ones like Impatience, vinca, zinnias, lantana, those things like it hot, and so they're not going to want to be out until it's hot. But I realize some nurseries let them go whenever. So um, May 1st, I would say. <laughs> oh, yeah, you could do, you could do a basket that deters mosquitoes. That was the question. Anything that we could plant to 
deter mosquitoes. Um, we have citronella geranium plants right now in the nursery. They're excellent. Um, lemon balm, you could do lemon balm. I think, I think even these agastachys with the smell because they do have anything with a mint smell, a lavender smell, or a citrus smell deters mosquitoes. Um, lemon balm, lemongrass, lemongrass, they advertise it as that, but it's not really strong smell. Um, trying to think what else. Lemon verbena. I do have some lemon verbena that would, it gets pretty tall, so it would be a good thriller if you wanted to do something like that. Um, but anything citrus or um, even this minty smell, they just don't like smelly things. Okay, so the question is, if I was to plant my vegetables in containers, do they need to be fed as often as the flowers? Um, I don't believe so. I don't think so. They, they could be fed, and what you could do is just mix, what I would do is just mix that feed right into the soil as you plant before we, you plant them. Do a time release in there or just a good um, vegetable garden so, um, fertilizer in there. And then probably just like once or twice a summer would be enough. Um, I've only really just done tomatoes in containers and super easy. Um, you might want to do some trimming, especially if they're pretty gangly, which sometimes they can get that way. Um, and give them plenty of root space in your container. Don't put them in a shallow container. Um, but I don't think they need to be fertilized as much as your flowers. So, because the flowers you're looking for bloom, you're wanting a lot of bloom power. So, you just again? Okay. That, that are joining later. So, they're, our late joiners are wondering who I am and what I'm doing here. <laughs> My name is Marjorie Ross, and I am the owner of Willard Bay Gardens, which is. Um, Long Old Highway 89, just the, in Willard City, northern Utah, and um, right across from Willard Bay, right up against the mountains. Um, we're a, a, we specialize in perennials and water-wise native things, but we also carry trees and shrubs, annuals, um, veggies, and we do do Saturday classes also. So if you want to check out our website and see if there's anything interesting, you want to go there. We do offer classes and baskets. We do make flowers and container baskets. So. Is that everything? Yay! Thanks for joining us, guys. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And we really appreciate Marjorie coming from Willard Bay. And so if you've never been to Willard Bay, please go there and check out the nursery. It's a great little nursery with, as she mentioned, a really, really good selection of, of perennials and well, and all the other stuff. So if you haven't done that, do that. It'll match up with our perennial class that we did last week. You will find many, many of those things and more that we talked about in our last week class. And then just a reminder for everyone, um, to, on Friday of this week, we're gonna do a little raised bed class. I'm not gonna plant it, but we're gonna show you if you're interested in how to construct your own simple raised beds. So please join us for that. Check our website for the additional classes that we've got scheduled online um, the rest of this month. And I think with that, we're done. Unless there's a few more questions that Janice can answer online. Otherwise, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome.